And today, as I said yesterday, today is when we're going to start pulling this all together. So no, no sort of new presentations, no new information, but just a bit of a sort of a reminder in a minute for me of some of the things that came out as really important to you all yesterday to get us back into the frame of what we're, we're going to be discussing today. So first up, just a little recap for me of some of the things that came out from you yesterday to get your heads back into the range of, this, of, of topics that we're talking about. So I'm going to share my screen. In a moment, just let me get to the right place. Always helps when I'm organized. So hopefully people can see my screen now and see the, the key question that we're, we're looking at here about how should members of the public be involved in decision making? And whereas last time we met, we talked about that sort of balance of power within that representative system between when we're looking at sort of government and parliament, now we're looking at what role does the public play and then when we come together for the fifth weekend, we're going to be looking at some of the sort of other roles around some regulations and standards there. So, one of the things we asked you to think about yesterday was that some key things that were needed to help the representative system work well. Now, in your groups, you were looking at, you know, what do people need from the system and what do people need to do themselves? And what I've done here is look back at all the jam boards and things you're working on yesterday afternoon to, to pull out some of the things that came up, not necessarily the most important things, but the things that came up across lots of the different groups. So one of the things that really we were talking about, you were talking about yesterday about what do people need from the system was that sense that actually politics and the political system needs to feel relevant to people that people need to see people like themselves within parliament, within government, and actually, you know, they're making decisions on their behalf. People need to feel like their vote carries a weight. There were lots and lots of talk, and I think particularly given some of the things that have been happening and have been sort of picked up in the media recently about sort of honesty and integrity within the system. And also there was quite a bit of discussion in a number of the groups about the role of media and the role of information, what that plays in terms of enabling people to feel engaged with the with the politic, with the decisions that are being made that affect their lives. And then the other side, what do people need to do themselves? Well, the key one that came up was actually, you know, if people want to be involved in the representative system, if people want to play a role in decision making, then actually stepping up and voting. Is, is key, but also not just at the vote, but actually speaking up if they feel strongly about saying, getting involved, going to, going talking to MPs, getting involved in, in um, campaign groups or pressure groups or protests. There was quite a bit about staying informed that came up across the different groups, but also at a certain point, you know, once the decision has been made, there was an argument made in a number of the groups that actually that decision has to be respected and move on. And down in the bottom corner there, there was that question of actually, you know, what do people need to do themselves? Be politicians, get actively involved. The other thing we were talking about yesterday afternoon was about where these different types of mechanisms that we were talking about could actually be adding value to a good system of representative democracy or potentially, you know, creating sort of risks or devaluing some of the things that we, we have that are good about the system. So again, these were things that came up across multiple groups about the power, you know, extending potential to extend the use of powers of petitions. 
that idea that, you know, they're adding, you know, it, it adds another way in for people if the use of power of petitions was extended that actually, you know, could be used to address the things that are coming from the bottom up, from community, things that parliament or government wasn't already planning to discuss but are seen as important to the public get on the agenda. But there are some risks as well, and it's about balancing when can these things be used well. So, you know, a risk of overuse, that people just lose interest, a risk that actually, you know, if, if, people, if a lot of people have become engaged in some putting a petition forward and it doesn't, you know, lead to the outcomes that they wanted, that actually that could lead to people becoming disengaged from the process. And also, again, that recognition that there will only be sort of selected engagement with any particular petition, not necessarily the whole population. You also talked about the sort of greater use of referendums. And one of the key sort of values that was put forward that for that of that it, it, it is the public making a decision and that it has the potential in a referendum to give a clear result. But again, when it's about something that a lot of people care about, then there can lead to a good turnout. But referendums that are being decided by, you know, smaller, smaller numbers of population, if people aren't actually engaging with them, then there's a risk that actually, you know, it, it's not necessarily what most people want. And actually, again, on the, on the sort of harm or devalue side and the purple there, the question that was raised by a number of groups is, you know, that idea is, is what most people want actually necessarily the right thing? Is it is majoritarianism or the majority the way to make important decisions? And the risk with referenda that was also highlighted was that it can simplify some complex types of considerations. And when you were talking about these sort of deliberative processes and things like citizens' assemblies, the thing that came across most strongly was that idea where it can add value is that it's about building consensus and really involving people from different backgrounds and different political stands in that deliberative process. That's about finding where there is common ground. And again, that it's not just about a vote or a sort of one way, you know, a choice decision, but it's about looking at the reasons behind it. So that ability to inform political decision making that way. But, you know, some of the limitations that people, you know, highlighted there were, you know, there is a risk or a limitation with use of these types of processes of realistically how many people can actively be involved in it. And there were questions raised about, you know, how representative can a random selected group be? And we were emphasizing random quite a bit um, in the discussions yesterday. I think one thing just to highlight to people is that when we talk about randomly selected, it's not entirely random, really. There is, you know, any sort of citizen assembly is also modeled to be representative of the whole population. So the balance in terms of age, balance in terms of gender, and often different political views. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and move on to, hopefully that was a bit of a sort of reminder of some of the things that you were talking about and some of the things that came up across the different groups. What we're going to do now, uh, before we go into the breakout rooms, is to just do another of these Mentimeter polls. Okay, so we're going to, to do a vote in a moment. Um, it's something I actually didn't ask Ed to set up, but hopefully he will be able to uh, set up something to text people a link. Uh, Ed, any chance you want to add something if you're there? I'll 
okay it's it's obviously sorry busy, i was on the wrong screen yes no problem i can do that <laughs> fantastic thank you so we're going to do a bit of a a, a mentimeter poll i know some people have had trouble before um getting into the polls but hopefully we will be able to um get everyone in today the poll is really just to sort of take a bit of a, a temperature of where we are okay so it's not it's not about um you know making final decisions at this point but we do really hope that everyone will be able to get in and participate so I'm just getting this set up in the background here. And then I will go back to showing you how you can get into the poll. So the poll is asking you a few questions that relate to some of the topics that we were talking about um, yesterday. To give us a start for today. So we've got three ways that you can get into the Mentimeter poll. And I've just realized I haven't been, I posted a link and I'm now showing my screen. So hopefully somebody else can post the link into the chat. I can the post chat the link, Kayla. Thank you. So there is a link that's going to be posted into the Zoom chat. If that works for you, you can click straight on that. And just like when we use the Jamboards, if that works for you, it should open up as a new window and you should be able to get into the Mentimeter poll. Alternatively, we're sending you a link. If you've got a smartphone and you've got text, you should be able to just go straight in by that link and get into the Mentimeter poll. The other way, and it might work for you, is you just open another window on your browser, just like if you were going to go online and search for any other information. Type in www.menti.com. And when it opens, you'll have the option of putting in a code. And once you're there, you should see a screen like this that says, I'm here and ready to vote. Answer the question and then submit. So hopefully that has worked for people. And I need to go now to the Mentimeter poll so I can check. We've got quite a lot in, which is great. I've even got someone who's not here, but this is good. <laughs> All right, so we'll just give people a moment if anyone's having a problem or needs me to show again the, the different options for getting in. But hopefully there's the link in the chat, the link via text or you can go to www.menti.com and enter the code if anyone needs me to remind them of the code you can do that or put it in to the chat okay Anyone need more time or are we there? And I guess for anyone who really can't get into these, you can also just note down your answers to any of the questions. And when you go into the breakout groups, your facilitators can put them in or you can send them to us either in the chat or by text and we can add them in. Okay. So we've got quite a lot of people there. And no one seems to be flagging to me that they have a problem. So hopefully, hopefully that means everyone who wants to, to vote is in there. So I'll move on to the next question. The real questions now. So a couple of questions there about how much of a problem do you think the UK's current system of representative democracy has? And a few different options there. And like last time, we're running on a, a scale of one to seven. 
So one is no problem at all. And seven, that it is a very big problem for the UK's democracy. So I can see people are starting to answer. So you, you get to put your mark on the scale for each of the statements there. So some of the statements are with people often not having the information they need to cast an informed vote, with too few people choosing to stand for elections, with politicians not paying enough attention to what ordinary people think, with MPs being more answerable to their party than the people that voted for them, and with people not listening to others enough. anyone who joined the, the, the meeting while we were sort of starting to do this vote, we're doing the Mentimeter vote. There's a link in the chat and you probably have got a text as well. So hopefully you'll be able to get in and join the conversation. So I'll just give people a few more moments to, to vote on this question. Okay, going to move on. I think we've got most people. Most people have voted there. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. Which is really, there are, the next two questions are asking about different types of issues. And when things like, you know, increased use of petitions or referendums or deliberative um, processes could actually be useful. So three different types of questions, three different types of issues, really. So just before we go on, that idea of sort of the constitutional issue. So things that are actually about the sort of the structure of, of the country and the system. So things like the balance of power between government and parliament as we were talking about last time we met, whether to change the voting system, for example, or the age at which you know, people are entitled to vote. The second set of types of issues are those kind of moral or ethical issues. And some of the, the examples that there's been quite a lot of discussion around recently are things like uh, assisted dying, so helping a terminally ill person to die, uh, rules on abortion or capital punishment that comes back up into the media every so often. So there's some moral ethical issues. And the third type of issues are policy issues. So they are the more sort of the policy issues decided by government, like what the rates of income tax should be, the, the date that's been set for sort of banning cars that run on petrol, or, or things like retirement age. So things that affect everybody, but are sort of government policy issues usually. So on to the next question. I want you to imagine decisions being made about these different types of issues. Should a referendum be used within the decision-making process or not? And again, we're on the scale of one to seven. So at one is never involve a referendum, a referendum. And number seven, always involve a referendum. And four would be in the middle of, you know, either undecided or, you know, unable to choose.
we've still got a few more people to answer, so we'll just give people another another moment there. Mm -hmm. So it does look like most people have, have cast their, their vote there. And again, these are not easy questions. They're, some of them have got to be a bit, you know, go with sort of your gut reaction at the moment. And when you do get into your groups and start talking about these, you'll be able to sort of test out some of the reasons why you're thinking. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next question. Which is, again, imagine a decision being made about these different types of issues. Could a deliberative process or a citizen, like a citizen assembly, maybe not a citizen assembly, but something similar to that, add value to the decision making or not? So again, one, would be never should a citizens assembly be used for, or something similar be used for these types to inf help inform these types of decisions or actually always a citizens assembly or something could add value or help inform decisions of this type. Okay, just a couple more people still to, to sort of answer there, and then we'll move on to our final question. Can I just ask a question? Yep. Uh, will the facilitators in as groups know? sort of the result of our answers when we come back to it a little bit later oh, in right. the morning yeah, yeah I'll, I'll share all the results because i know no one can see the results apart from me at the minute so yeah. i'll share them all back and the facilitators will have access to them when we when we come into the the discussion groups well we did keep a lot to yourself <laughs> so there's some interesting results you'll be excited later <laughs> All right, and our final question. Should a formal parliamentary petitioning system, so again, we're talking petitions that are part of the parliamentary decision-making process, not, not necessarily just a petition that somebody has initiated and gone around the streets and got people to sign up to, should a formal parliamentary petitioning system be able to be used to do these different things? So we've got demand a referendum, on an issue, demand a public inquiry on an issue, demand a citizens assembly, demand a general election, or demand a debate in parliament on an issue. And again, one, absolutely not. Seven, yes, definitely. And if you're around a four, that means that you're just not sure. So these are some of the issues we were talking about yesterday after Jess's presentation.
Okay, thank you all for doing that. I know there's a couple of people still just putting their final answers in and, and that's great. So before we share the results and we actually get into discussing this, what I want you to do, what, we, what we're going to ask you to do is go back to thinking about some of the principles to start off this morning. So we were talking about the principles that are needed, you know, principles that you came up with in weekend two about a good, what would be important in a good democracy. So I'm just going to remind you again of some of the principles that you had focused on. I know we started yesterday morning starting talking about some of these things. So Excuse me, I didn't click send me the results. Am I supposed to click that? Uh, no, I'll, sh I'll share them all with you later. Yeah, but you were, I give you three things to do. Either sign up to the Metro Meter, send the results, yeah. or join another presentation. We weren't click any of them? Not really, no. Right, okay. Uh, unless, yeah, it's not really worth signing up. Other presentations would just be random questions people are asking. So, nah, just do none of them. So, these were the ones that I highlighted to you yesterday out of the principles, the ones in yellow, that were really around the role of the role of the public and the role of the public in decision making that you'd highlighted there. And I just so we had these emerging principles that were particularly related, particularly relevant to the role of the public, about free and inclusive elections, accountability, systems of accountability, so you can challenge uh, politicians who are doing a poor job, that informed and educated voter base, the importance of diversity in who actually is, is in parliament and government, and importantly, you highlighted that freedom of thought and speech so that actually there can be an effective public mm -hmm. debate around key issues. On this next screen, I've highlighted a couple more as well that really are around the relationship between the public and their elected representatives. So ones that you picked up were things like fair representation, so that the people who are elected are actually you know, representing the views of their electorate, so that the decisions made are driven by what the people want. You highlighted this idea that expectation that ministers are knowledgeable about their policy areas so that the public can actually have faith that the decisions are evidence-based and effective. Honesty in politics came up quite a lot in your discussions by the weekend too, and I know yesterday as well. Transparency in decision making. So again, that relationship that the public expect to be able to see and understand how decisions and why decisions are being made, even if they don't agree. And a commitment from elected governments to deliver on their manifesto. So that, you know, so that people who are voting, if you vote for someone, you expect to know what they're going to deliver for you. And these were all relationships that you highlighted as being important principles. So we are going to go into the breakout rooms. We're only going in for about 25 minutes now, just to sort of focus in on some of those principles and explore a little bit further what they mean before we start looking at what are our conclusions out of this weekend. As I said yesterday, we're going to have a break at 5 to 11. Uh, I'm aware it's Remembrance Sunday and people may want to observe a minute of silence, so you will have that opportunity over the break if that's something you choose to do. Over to you, Juliet. So a bit of a reminder of the question that we're going to be looking at in this next discussion. So you'll recognize the screen from yesterday that Alan shared around, we're really focusing on this, the democratic system. And what is needed for the representative system as we have, to work well and what role you know what role is there for people in decision making within that system so what if anything do people need from the system to be able to play an effective role and what if anything do people need to do themselves so that they're able to play that sort of an effective 
and influential role. And as I reminded you this morning, these are some of the things that you were talking about yesterday. And it's not everything you were talking about, but it was just some of the key things that, you know, that came up across a number of the different groups that you might want to be considering again when we go into the next round of discussions about, you know, how do we make, how can we make these things work well? And just so you can see, this is the vote that we were doing earlier in the day, the poll. You know, how much of a problem do we think some of these questions are in our current UK democracy? And as you can see, for all of them, with as a group, you're tending towards that they are a bit of a problem for an effective or a good system of representative democracy. So yeah, you can see the distribution there, the ones that came out most, most strongly being considered a problem, where again, politicians not paying enough attention to what ordinary people think, and politicians being more answerable to their parties. But it, almost equally as strongly there is people in general not listening to others enough, not actually listening or not having the information they need when they're engaging with the system. And whether that's down to people needing to take action themselves or whether that's down to how information is out there are things you'll get to consider when you go back into the next groups. So what you're focusing on here really is what are some of the biggest barriers to actually that representative system working well? And I'll hand it over to you guys. I know it can seem that time flies when you're in these conversations, trying to sort of really get your, your, your points across and capture uh, what's important. But, you know, hopefully we're getting some good sort of ideas there on the statements, even if they're not sort of fully, fully crafted and wordsmithed, as long as we've got the ideas, we'll have something to work with when we come back together to reconsider them. Now, in the next section, we're going to be looking at the sort of different mechanisms so again, we've been focusing on, although there's a whole lot of different ways that people could be more involved in decision-making within the representative system, we've been focusing on this idea of petitions and referendums and deliberative processes. So each group for the next section has actually been allocated one to focus on. So hopefully you'll be able to sort of get some ideas down around when these things actually can add value. So we've had to divide it up between three because to try and cover all of them, I think you might just sort of run out of time. So hopefully the one that has been allocated to your group is one that you can get engaged with. But before we go into that, I'm just going to share the results of the, the poll this morning around these different topics. So... so we asked you to imagine that decision was being made about these different types of issues and asked whether referendum should be used or would add value to this process. So what you can see there, that the one that came out slightly above everything else was that people thought that actually there was value in using referenda around some bigger constitutional issues. There was also some, um, yeah, definitely some sort of favor towards using them around moral or ethical issues. Although we're a bit more spread across, you can see the pale pink there oh, right across the spectrum. And less, and less than sort of half, if you think four as being our average, that actually referendums were referendums were a sensible thing to be using around more general policy issues. We also asked the same question there about where a deliberative process could add value to a decision making or not. And again, around some constitutional issues, there was considerable support and moral and ethical issues, even more support there, just slightly more support about potentially sort of digging into when 
would these types of decisions be most appropriate? And again, seen as adding value potentially to policy issues. And when we looked at the sort of parliamentary petitioning system, quite a mixed range there of when, uh, a, oh, sorry, what a petition should be able to call for. The highest one there was the debate in parliament on an issue, and again, or a public inquiry on an issue. And again, just under half support or half level support for demanding a general election, which I know is something that was discussed quite a bit yesterday in some of the groups around whether actually that was a, a viable and useful thing to be adding to our political system. So that just gives you a bit of a starting point for when you go into the discussions. Um, again, looking at what the group as a whole has, has said may help you frame some of your sort of developing ideas and recommendations around how these mechanisms should be used. So I'll hand back to your groups and your facilitators for the rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your work this morning. Hopefully, um, we've had a quick look. I, I sort of do a little bit of stalking occasionally on your jam boards and see what sort of discussions are going on, but it looks like lots of good conclusions, lots of great ideas coming forward there. So thank you very, very much for that. I'm just going to pass over to Alan, who's got a couple of bits to say, sort of leading into next weekend, but also just to sort of tie together some of the discussions we've been having today as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kala. So um, some of you yesterday were asking various questions about how a citizens assembly operates and particularly how this citizens assembly is operating. So we thought it would be useful just to say a few words to uh, kind of, I mean, repeat things that we've said before, but just to um, uh, remind you about how this assembly operates. So one question that was being asked was about whether a, an assembly like this is representative of the population as a whole. So just remember, uh, those letters that you all got, so random letters to people around the country as a whole, and uh, and then we selected in order to make sure that you're representative of the population in terms of age and gender and ethnic background and uh, what formal education you've had and whether you have any kind of disability and uh, where you live in the country and also how you voted in the 2016 referendum and how you voted in the 2019 general election, including whether you voted or not in those. So you're a representative of the, of the country in terms of all sorts of different things. Um, some of the questions were about the topic of the assembly and how that is decided and how it's decided what you're uh, focusing on. So when we first set up this citizens assembly, like any citizens assembly, it has to be asking, answering a particular question. So, you know, we define the overall topic in terms of exploring what kind of democracy people want to live in. And there are some particular bits of that that again were defined in advance because uh, that's what was kind of set uh, when we uh, when we uh, created the assembly in terms of the roles of parliament and government, the role of the public as we've been discussing this time, also the role of judges in the system. But we've also been kind of in the background changing uh, details of what we're doing in response to uh, what's been coming up from your conversations. So for example, originally we weren't actually thinking that we would be talking about petitions very much or, or, or uh, uh, petitions leading to referendums, that kind of thing. But these sorts of ideas we could hear coming from you and floating up through your conversations. So we thought it would be important for you to uh, discuss those things. There was a question about um, how the organizers of a citizens assembly ensure that there's proper balance and we're not kind of pushing you in a particular direction and one part of that is that we try really hard just to be fair and balanced between different points of view but we also have an advisory board um, that includes on it so there are two conservative mps on there there's a labor mp and a labor member of the house of lords there's a MP from the Scottish National Party, there are various lawyers and academics with different expertise, so they're an incredibly diverse group of people uh, with all sorts of different views on these issues who come come together and give us fantastic advice and look at the plans and see whether we're uh, being as balanced as we're, as we're trying to be. And then the final question that you were asking was about the results from the assembly and uh, how we're going to try to maximize the impact of those. 
So there will be a report that we write that is based on the conclusions that you're drawing and you'll be you know, finally drawing those conclusions that we can six. And we'll be sending that, that report to MPs and ministers in the UK Parliament and also Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we'll be having conversations with them. And we know a lot of them are interested because we've already been having those conversations and we'll be pursuing that as far as possible. And also you'll have noticed we're doing research about the citizens assembly itself and how that process is working. And that's because there are all the kinds of questions that you've been asking about how does a citizens assembly work? Just what, what happens in a citizens assembly in practice? So we'll be able to get lots of evidence from this process that helps inform those debates about the role that citizens assemblies can play in democracy. So that's just hopefully giving you a little bit of a refresh on what we're doing in this uh, citizens assembly. Two final things. Firstly, survey. So it's survey time again. Um, so hopefully you've just received in the last few minutes uh, uh, an email inviting you to complete the next survey uh, for this uh, weekend of the Citizens Assembly. It is always just incredibly helpful for us to have your responses to that survey. That really does feed into the research that we're doing uh, on how, how this Citizens Assembly is working. And remember, there will be another draw uh, at the start of the next weekend. I promised to get a better hat, okay? I know my hat wasn't the, uh, the best. Uh, I promise that I will find a better hat and we'll do another draw for an extra, extra hundred pound reward for one of the people who has come, uh, filled in the survey. Um, and then next weekend, we're looking at ways of upholding rules and standards. So a lot of you have been quite concerned, I know, about some of the behavior of MPs that we've seen highlighted in the last few weeks. So that's part of what we'll be discussing next weekend and other issues. I won't try to go into it now because it's already half past, um, but other issues that we'll be looking at next weekend as well. So that's enough for me. Back to Kayla. So it just leaves it to me to say thank you and close the meeting and hope you enjoy your afternoons. Get some good lunch. <laughs>